Hi, I'm releasing this preamble to the video because I wanted to release all of this by September 23rd, which was election day here in New Zealand, but right now it is September the 26th, Tuesday, so I'm many days late because I got shit to do, motherfucker. I can't just sit around making goddamn YouTube videos. I got a goddamn life. I'm important. And I gotta drink beer. So the results of the New Zealand election are already out. On Saturday, got some beer, went to a election viewing party. I didn't even know those existed, but now I do. And saw the results come in. Now this is gonna be total spoilers. If you haven't seen the election, maybe just go back and check it out. I don't wanna give anything away. And in order to understand the results of this election, you need some familiarity perhaps with the MMP or mixed member proportional system that we use to elect our parliament. The other day I saw a really awesome video that explains MMP in a really simple and easy to understand way, which I will link in the description. As I said, total spoilers about the election here. Our centre-right National Party got 46% of the vote and 58 total seats. The Labour Party, our centre-left party, got 35.8% of the votes and 45 total seats. New Zealand First Party, kind of centrist nationalist party, got 7.5% of the vote and 9 seats. Green Party, our more uber-lefty party, got 5.9% of the votes and 7 total seats. And Act New Zealand, kind of centrist right-wing douchebag guy, got one seat and everyone else was fucked. So who won then? Well right now because of MMP it's really unclear because the only way that one of the parties either National or Labour is going to come to power is through making a coalition with New Zealand First who are the more nationalist party. If they make a coalition with the centre-right party, National, they will have an easy majority. Or if New Zealand First goes into coalition with Labour and the Green Party, they could squeak through a small majority enough to lead. In New Zealand, the politician Winston Peters somehow always manages to be the deciding factor in recent elections. And this election is no different. It's all gonna come down to what Winston Peters decides to do. And he says he's in no rush to choose a coalition partner yet. So maybe this means the National Party totally won. Or maybe, surprisingly, he will go with Labour because he has kind of a negative history with the National Party. We'll just have to wait and see. I personally think that it's probably more likely that he's going to go with the National Party because they're only three seats away from having a majority and it will just be a more comfortable position to be in for everybody involved. But because Winston Peters has a negative history with National, maybe he'll surprise everybody and go with Labour and that will just screw up everybody's expectations. So that's one of the difficulties of the MMP system. The whole country is kind of in limbo after this election. We're not really sure what's going to happen we'll just have to wait and see anyways enjoy my video about New Zealand politics and I apologize if it's slightly redundant at this point well fuck off cat you totally ruined that bit transition time <coughs> g'day so in my adventures on the internet talking about politics I like to talk about American politics a lot <laughs> I like to be like, hey, what's going on with those Democrats and the Conservatives and that Senate and that Electoral College and all of those exciting American type things? Someone inevitably says, well, what country are you from? And I'm like, New Zealand? New Zealand? Is it even a country? What the fuck? How could a man from Mordor possibly understand our complicated system? Ignorant foreigners always trying to comment on America. You couldn't possibly understand how our system of balances and checks and state rights works. You fucking ignorant. Stupid cock. You are automatically completely ignorant on everything to do with America. I don't come around to your hobbit house and tell you how to rule your affairs to do with the ring. If you ever come to America, I will kill you! And that sort of thing. And normally I'm like, hey, well, you know, like, I may be from New Zealand, but due to, like, globalization and the internet, I can share opinions about anything I want to share my opinions about, and information from your country is readily available to me. And just because you're not from a country doesn't mean you can't opine on that country because information is out there and we can all look at it and we can all learn about it and they might counter with something like ignorant foreigner mind your own business and that's the kind of constructive back and forth we have so taking on your advice i've decided to stay in my lane stick to my own kind and stop being such a nosy foreign devil and talk about the politics of my own country new zealand <laughs> contrary to popular belief new zealand does have politics and for what it is 
it could be worse. Very excitingly, we have an election coming up on the 23rd of September, which is this coming Saturday, which is why I wanted to get this video out before that date came around. It's a very exciting battle between Jacinda Ardern from Labour and Bill English from National. Fight. But what is Labour? What is National? What is New Zealand politics? Allow me to explain. And in order to do that, we have to look at history. 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 The history of New Zealand began in 1642 as laid out here in the Penguin History of New Zealand by famous historian Michael King. The first actual human to set sights on New Zealand was Abel Janzoom Tasman. Allow me to read. First let me set the scene on 18 December 1642 after having come from Tasmania, which Tasman had named Van Diemen's Land. His ships rounded Farewell Spit in the South Island and anchored in the bay Māori knew as Taitapu. For what followed, we have only the accounts of the Dutch witnesses. In the thickening dusk of 18 December, two double-hulled canoes packed with Māori put out from shore to inspect the ships. They began to call out to us in a gruff hollow voice, but we could not in the least understand any of it. They blew also many times on an instrument which gave a sound like the Moors trumpet. We had one of our own sailors blow back to them an answer. Those of the Zihan did likewise. And that's what a Dutch person sounds like. It's likely that the locals were asserting their identity and mana, and raising their own morale by challenging the visitors to a fight. The Maori convention was to take the offensive in an uncertain situation so as to encourage themselves and discourage an adversary, and thus make their own survival more likely. It was by this time a long established code of behaviour that would have been comprehensible to other Maori. It was not comprehensible to Tasman's men, however, who'd failed to recognise that a highly specific specific protocol had been set in motion. Dutch trumpeters from both vessels had returned the Maricals made from pukai, long wooden trumpets, imagining perhaps that this would establish a basis for congenial mutuality. In the Maori view, however, all that happened was a challenge to fight had been issued and accepted. The outcome was inevitable, but as far as the Dutch men were concerned, wholly unexpected. What went on to happen was that some of Tasman's men went to get some water and then on the way back one of their boats was rammed by a canoe with 13 Maori in it who then beat to death three of the Dutch men and a fourth died later. Tasman said, fuck this country, this is a bunch of bullshit, I cannot be bothered with this crap. And he just fucked right off. After that, no European came to New Zealand for 126 years. I guess when Abel Tasman got back he was like, that place was horrible, let's never go back there again and everyone was like, Okay, although apparently he did think the landmass was part of South America, so it probably didn't dawn on him that it, he'd discovered a whole new place. Tasman called the new country Statenland because he speculated that it might be the western extremity of Statenland of the southwest coast of South America, named by his countryman Jacob Lemaire in 1616. When late in 1643 this was perceived to be impossible, the southern American location having been identified by Hendrik Brower, an anonymous cartographer in the Dutch East India Company renamed Tasman's line of coast New Zealand, or in Latin, Zelandia Nova. So they knew there was some particular land mass out here, but they didn't really know what it looked like, how big it was. No European came to New Zealand again for 126 years. When sexy man James Cook, Captain Superman Ultimate Best Guy Cook that everybody fucking loves, was like, you know what, I'm gonna go back. In Tahiti in July 1769, I'm so Lieutenant James Cook awesome. of the British Royal Navy completed his observation of the transit of the planet Venus across the face of the sun. He then opened secret admiralty instructions to sail south until he either discovered Terra Australis Incognita, or else fall in with the eastern side of the land discovered by Tasman, and now called New Zealand. So basically, he was the first person to sail around New Zealand and map the coastline, and the second human being to ever go to New Zealand. James Cook got a translator from Tahiti who helped him communicate with the locals, and he soon ingratiated himself with the native people. The rest, as they say, is history. Slowly, over the course of time, more and more Europeans came to New Zealand, which eventually became a colony of the British Empire. 
So for a period of time, Captain Cook was just chilling out in New Zealand, mapping it, getting to know the locals. And it says here, for Maori life did not particularly change very much for a while. In 1788, New Zealand fell under the governance of Australia and became a part of New South Wales. The book describes how various convicts in Australia actually managed to escape to New Zealand and join the Maori population. And the initial activity that brought people to New Zealand, apparently, was sealing. Indirectly, sealing was responsible for the establishment of the first European community in New Zealand. 1839, there were about 2,000 immigrants in New Zealand. By 1852, there was about 28,000. The decisive moment for this remarkable change was 1840. In that year, the Treaty of Waitangi was signed. This established British authority in the European eyes and gave British immigrants legal rights as citizens. The treaty helped ensure that for the next century and beyond, most immigrants to New Zealand would come from the United Kingdom. Upon signing the Treaty of Waitangi, New Zealand became the colony of New Zealand. And eventually, in 1907, the Dominion of New Zealand. And finally, in 1931, with the Statute of Westminster, New Zealand gained full independence and just became New Zealand. But what about the politics, you may ask? I'm not a historical expert, but speaking from my impressions, as a colony of New Zealand, Europeans were living with a kind of uneasy alliance with the Maori and had to respect tribal law. Tensions slowly developed with the Maori, leading to the New Zealand Wars, which took place from 1845 to 1872. You can tell that I'm reading it off the screen over here. The result of the wars were basically that a huge amount of Maori land was confiscated. And once the dust was settled, New Zealand needed to decide if it was going to have New Zealand politics. Okay. New Zealand politics was invented by Chester New Zealand politics. He was a local man with the following quote. Now that we have subdued the Maori people and have subsequently raped their women and crushed their souls, it is necessary to create a system in this great outcrop of the British Empire known as New Zealand, which may represent the white interests for now until the end of eternity. This system I will dub New Zealand politics, named after myself, Chester New Zealand politics. And based on this decree, the first political party in New Zealand was born the New Zealand Liberal Party, which existed from 1891 to 1912, based on Wikipedia. The Liberal Party spent about 20 years dominating everything because they were pretty much the only political party around. But there were some other minor parties like the Socialist Party and the Independent Political Labour League, who eventually merged in 1912 to create the United Labour Party, which then merged with the Social Democratic Party in 1913 to become the Labour Party. And thus, in 1916, the Labour Party was born, one of the two main political parties that we have today in this country. But the Labour Party could not have been born if it wasn't for John opposition party. Family man and New Zealand Thurishan was quoted as thus. While just a New Zealand politics idea of New Zealand politics was quite solid, we cannot in perpetuity have one party ruling in the interest of the whites, but two. This is the only way to keep the blacks, as I call them, or Maori, down. And thus I propose we introduce an opposition party, and that we name this party after myself, John Opposition Party. So John Opposition Party's dream was born. Confusingly though, the first Prime Minister was Henry Sewell, who was called a Premier instead of a Prime Minister. And there were elections prior to parties existing. The first multi-party period came when the Reform Party was created to have opposition to the Liberal Party, and they made their presence known in the 18th Parliament of 1911. And the Reform Party eventually became the National Party, which we know and love today. So why did I tell you about all of this history, about stuff to do with New Zealand politics? I don't fucking know. And this leads me to my personal feelings about politics in New Zealand. In contemporary New Zealand today, we've got a whole bunch of parties. The two main parties are the center left, Labour Party and the centre-right National Party. Unlike American politics, everything is kind of closer together in New Zealand. In the UK, parties like UKIP and the BMP, far-right parties, are a lot more visible than sort of sideline parties in New Zealand because they just do not have 
the numbers of people necessary to back them up and put them out there into the bloodstream. Even though those parties in the UK also fail to get votes, they're also a lot more visible than the kooky side parties in New Zealand. And we've got a huge range of parties that you never would even know existed unless you go look at the list of parties. The main players in New Zealand are the Labour Party, Centre Left, National, Centre Right, New Zealand First, which my wife has corrected me on and said, actually they're fairly socially liberal, they just appeal a lot to old people and people who hate immigrants. But they do believe in like social programs for not immigrants. The Maori Party. When I was growing up, the Green Party was all the rage because they had this guy called Nandor Tankos who was really young and hip and he had these natty dreadlocks and everyone was amazed and their minds were blown by this dude being in parliament having dreadlocks. But besides that growing up, I mean, I didn't really give a fuck about any of it. It's not like American politics. It's not sexy and exciting. From what I understand from doctors, that's really rare. If it's a legitimate rape, uh, the female body has ways to try to shut that whole thing down. It's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, uh, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> you need five. Oh, five, yeah, okay. So, five. commerce, education, and uh, the, um, um, uh, EPA? EPA, there you go. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. And the things that they fight about in New Zealand to do with politics, they are national issues that we care about, but it's just not as dynamic. It's not like they're bringing rapists, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing, oh my crime and oh Jesus Christ. It's more talking about like relative numbers of refugees and dealing with certain projects and housing and how we should approach education and, and sort of these key issues, but lacking the kind of wrestling and the extremism of a lot of American politics, which is why I think I took more of an interest in that country, even though I'm from this country. And I know that the things happening in New Zealand politics do matter and they affect me more, so I should be more motivated to care more about them. But it's difficult to feel like the things that they fight about in New Zealand politics are not trivial, even though they're not really trivial, at least they shouldn't be. Growing up, National was in power under Jim Bolger, and I remember thinking like he was like a really cool, at least as a kid. I mean, when I was a kid, I thought Bill Clinton was really cool and hip and rad. And then I saw George W. Bush and that made me realize that presidents don't necessarily have to be good leaders. They're just presidents. So that kind of disillusioned me. And he was succeeded by the first female prime minister, Jenny Shipley. She was in office for two years and I thought she was fine, but she didn't last very long. And then Labour finally had their day with Helen Clark, who people call Auntie Helen and they kind of love Helen Clark. She's like New Zealand's Hillary Clinton if Hillary Clinton could win and people actually liked her. I always thought she was a bit gruff and had a bit of a hard exterior but she was beloved and it was kind of like the golden age of labor at least recently but after her reign John Key came along in 2008 and he just dominated New Zealand politics until he decided to quit recently. We'll get uh, John Key. <laughs> You're going to be nervous when you line up on those path threes now, aren't you? You're munted, mate. You're never going to make it. You've got that gay red top on there. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how you really feel. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> And now we have a new election. It seemed to me the left wing party or Labour had just been completely wallowing in nothingness. Nobody cared about them. I certainly didn't pay any attention to them. I don't know anybody who gave a fuck about Labour because although John Key was a smarmy douchebag who's trying to privatize everything, cutting public sector jobs and so forth, the leader of Labour came to be Andrew Little who had the charisma of a plank of wood if a plank of wood could somehow be less likable than a human, which I guess it could. So it was kind of like someone had a plank of wood and they were smacking in the face with it. That's what he was, except less charismatic than that. And I always thought Andrew Little seemed like a really nice man. I've mentioned my wife already in this video. She pays a lot closer attention to New Zealand politics. She really gets into the minutia and the ins and outs of everything. And she said, yeah, he's a really nice guy. Like Andrew Little is really nice. He really cares about the issues. He cares about the people. He deeply cares about these things. The reason that he is in government is because he gives a shit. But whenever you saw him speak or say anything, he just came off as dour and unlikable and a bit sad. So recently he got ousted and replaced it by Jacinda Ardern, who created the Jacinda effect because she's young, she's cool, she's hip, she's trendy. Everybody's on the Jacinda train. She is coming along to give Labour a new chance. Just like Madonna, New Zealand's new Labour leader is best known by her first name, Jacinda. 
But Jacinda Ardern might well be renamed Lazarus for resurrecting her party's chances of winning this weekend's election, particularly given she only became opposition leader a few weeks ago. And I'm sure there's a few differences between her and Andrew Little, but it really goes to show how politics is all about just that, that likability and that certain it factor that you kind of need to succeed. And John Key, even though he was like a smarmy idiot prick with policies that weren't particularly good for the poor, because he's just sort of like a standard Blairite politician, slowly cutting away at social services and just saving every penny because that's the thing that's more important than actually giving people a decent standard of living. He had a certain style to him that just made him incredibly likable to a lot of the populace. And his deputy prime minister, Bill English, has already failed miserably in an election, being one of the least likable candidates of all time. He became the prime minister after John Key resigned. And now it's a battle between like a stale, boring, annoying dude who writes the worst poetry anybody has ever heard. There's the hill out there. I can see from my beehive window. This is one bit where I run. And bits like this, I walk. Still walking. It's quite a big hill, but it's always worth it. For the view, and it gets better. I'm running this bit. Now you're thinking, is it him? Yup, it is. Not just a voiceover. This is the bit where you feel fast. This bit makes you feel slow. It's pretty good to be able to do it. And a cool, hip, young, trendy, awesome Jacinda Ardern. But it's not really about the issues, particularly. I know certain people will care about that. And I found an excellent website where you can actually just weigh up each individual issue to do with the parties, uh, which I will link, because the election's coming up and you have to make your decision. But I often don't feel like it's really about that. It's just about, like, who do you like the most? And that's what it's really going to come down to. And then there's going to be certain core national voters who you're not going to be able to budge from that message. And the Labour message is, let's do this! With a picture of Jacinda being all young and trendy and cool, and everyone's like, let's try a new thing. And Nationals 1 is delivering for New Zealand, which just sounds boring as fuck like someone's giving you your mail okay so i guess the post office will still vaguely function but that's boring it's not let's do this let's do something new but full disclosure i actually voted for the greens and my vote will only count if the greens get over the five percent threshold to be able to be in the government otherwise it was complete waste and i could have just as much voted for national. So my hope and dream is that the Greens do get into Parliament and cross the threshold so that they can make a coalition with Labour. Otherwise, I apologise because I have assisted national. And the reason I didn't vote for Labour is because I don't like the way that they talk about immigration, but you can find it all out on their webpage. I wanted this video to be more complete and better than it was, but I need to buy a new battery for this camera because it keeps running out of batteries and I don't have the time to just constantly re-record shit. It's making me a little bit frantic, the fact that the battery keeps running out. So I need to get two batteries that I can just record freely. And you know what, I'm just gonna check the fucking notes I wrote. What else is I gonna goddamn say about New Zealand fucking politics? Oh yeah, I was gonna end with a joke. The current situation is trendy versus uncool guy and the issues are if you choose to look at the issues and think about your vote. But for me, I normally just try to go for the most left-wing thing possible. And the Labour Party's immigration policy threw me off. And I also feel reticent to vote for someone just because they're hip and cool and trendy. When in reality, very little has changed between having her and having Andrew Little, except Andrew Little had no goddamn charisma at all. And I was just gonna finish with a joke about my next video is going to be about Donald Trump, it's going to be about fucking American shit in the goddamn America, but running out of goddamn batteries has completely thrown me off because I can't keep doing this goddamn video because the fucking battery is going to run out. Where's the hammer? Is it on the, go up on the other floor. Somebody go up there and stop the hammering. Fuck. Stop the hammering. Anyways, I hope you're now interested in Hobbiton. I think I'll make this video better by editing in some interesting stuff that's informative. Call fucking Phil Griffin. I don't care who the fuck you have to call. Stop the hammering. And I'll provide some links so you can read about this fucking country. I don't know why I swore like that. It is a country. Like, it's legitimately like a country that you could read about. Jesus Christ. Crazy fucking sound coming in my ear, this fucking stupid hammering.
Make sure you vote. Do your democratic duty, but do not vote for New Zealand first because there are a bunch of racists. Just is what it is. And, <laughs> and don't vote for National because they are a maybe on legalizing medical marijuana. And for me, that's unacceptable. And also they are center-right fuckheads. But I guess like in a voting base, which just doesn't have the numbers of other countries, the extremes just really do not have a chance to get in the spotlight. Like in countries like America, where insane fuckheads can become their leader. And in the modern climate, you know, our right-wing parties are forced to care about more progressive issues such as this. The median wage in New Zealand in the last 12 months went up 3.6%, well ahead of inflation. And you know, it was interesting, women's pay went up quite a bit further than men's and the gender gap, jet, the gender gap <laughs> dropped from 12% to 9% and we now have the fifth lowest gender pay gap in the world. Even our right-wing party has to talk about the Grenda Pro Grap. The Grenda Say Brap. The Gender Pay Grap. Alright, this video's done. New Zealand. These fucking things.